have any trepidation? No, it should be very interesting. When you arrived at the Supreme Court, how was it? What was it like? Well, it was a very intense experience, to say the least. Intense because? Because of all of the attention that was being given nationwide to the fact that finally, after 191 years, a woman had been put on the Supreme Court of the United States. It was a very difficult job, and it's hard enough to do without a lot of media attention being given to it. And frankly, uh, you and your colleagues paid too much attention to it, I thought. Why? Why it shouldn't did. we have paid attention to it? Because it was a historic oh, yes, appointment. Yes, that's fine. But then let's move on and let's let the work be done. Um, and it didn't seem to work that way, because everywhere that Sandra went, the press was sure to go. Sure. <laughs> the first woman ever to sit on the highest court in the land, Sandra Day O'Connor was meant to be a symbol a gesture to women proffered by a political party that had turned its back on their quest for equality. I'm announcing today that one of the first Supreme Court vacancies in my administration will be filled by the most qualified woman I can possibly find. In her quarter of a century on the bench, however, she proved far more. Send Judge O'Connor back to Arizona! She's got too bad a record in killing babies! Confirmed amid the first salvos of the culture wars, O'Connor would find herself holding the court's center of gravity, striving to keep the law from radically changing direction and the country from going to extremes. Whether she actually bridged differences or merely papered over them would remain a matter of debate. But with consensus and civility, her defining creed she nevertheless became the most influential Supreme Court justice of her time. She was smart, and she was staggeringly energetic, and she could carry both roles, the conventional female role that made her not scary, oh, come on. and the tough-minded <laughs> judicial role that made her powerful. She was the perfect first. procedure that could lead to the first woman on the Supreme Court formally began today. The Senate Judiciary Committee opened confirmation hearings on the nomination of Judge Sandra Day O'Connor. When she arrived on Capitol Hill on the morning of September 9, 1981, Sandra Day O'Connor already was the most talked about judicial nominee in American history. Judge O'Connor is known as a forceful, determined, no-nonsense woman who's not afraid to speak her mind. The brethren will no longer be the same, assuming she takes her place among them. Nice For the next three days, she would also be the most watched. Are you ready? Well, I hope so. Are you nervous? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Only 51 years old, she could be a power on the Supreme Court well into the 21st century. There are more requests for press passes to her confirmation hearing than there were to the Watergate hearings. It's the first time judicial confirmation hearings have been run on TV gavel to gavel, and there are tens of millions of people watching. Everybody that had a television was tuned in because she was a figure of fascination. The notion of a woman on the court was so unusual. She was going to be different. A lifelong Republican, O'Connor had been nominated to the court by President Ronald Reagan and now strode into the hearing room on the arms of party stalwarts, Senators Goldwater and Thurmond. Judge O'Connor, the time has now come for you to testify. Will you stand and be sworn? Her conservative bona fides seemed assured. 
As the first woman to be nominated as a Supreme Court Justice, I'm particularly honored, and I happily share the honor with millions of American women of yesterday and of today. Outside the Senate chamber, however, fellow Republicans denounced her. We don't want her on the Supreme Court. Right, yes, the final no. They were Christian conservatives, the vanguard of a mounting counter-revolution forged by opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment and fueled by a generation's worth of liberal Supreme Court decisions, especially Roe v. Wade, the controversial 1973 decision that established a right to abortion. Looking at the Democratic platform, well, I know that Christ would not support that platform. Their votes had helped catapult Reagan into the presidency. The Supreme Court declared war on the unborn in America. The one thing he could do for us as president, the big thing, was to appoint new justices to the Supreme Court to turn this carnage around, to stop this slaughter. There was controversy following the president's announcement concerning O'Connor's positions on the issues of abortion and the Equal Rights Amendment. Is the first woman nominated for the Supreme Court too much of a feminist? Some right-wing groups think so. Sandra O'Connor is trying to keep their opinion from endangering her confirmation. One might inquire as to your general feelings on the rights of women and how that might be reflected in the public policy arena. On the subject of abortion, would you discuss your philosophy on abortion, both personal and judicial? The personal views of a Supreme Court justice, and indeed any judge, uh, should be set aside. Judge O'Connor spent most of the day dodging specific answers. Turning to the subject that I'm sure probably will never end, and that's the question of abortion. Okay, Senator, uh, my personal views and beliefs have no place in the resolution of any legal issues. I do not believe that as a nominee I can tell you how I might vote on a particular issue. It's just that I feel that it's improper for me to endorse or criticize that decision. Judge, I'm, I'm going to vote for you. I, I think you'll make a heck of a good judge. Um, but I'm a little disturbed about the reluctance to answer any questions. Um, Within the Senate chamber, O'Connor's assertion of judicial independence was a virtue. And by the hearing's third day, she was widely thought to have a lock on the confirmation. But when it came to the demonstration in the street and the growing ideological divide over American values, no one could say for certain which side she was on. came naturally to a person raised as Sandra Day had been. Miles from nowhere in the southeastern corner of Arizona, on a 160,000 acre cattle ranch called the Lazy Bee. It took a man on horseback a whole day just to ride across it. The Day family called it their own country, and it was. There was nobody else there. Arizona was really a frontier place in the 30s when she was growing up. So everybody had to pitch in. It was just a tiny little society in which she was an equal. She learned to fire a rifle when she was old enough to hold one, to drive a truck when she was about 10. You can't overstate the self-reliance you get growing up in a place like that. You solve your own problems, and the job isn't finished until it's finished. 